It was only three days ago that one of the most respected scientists the planet has ever seen unfortunately passed away. Stephen Hawkins last year left us with a major change of his prediction about the future of humanity. He used to write that the human race would have a thousand years left on planet Earth. Last year he revised it to 100 years. 100 years is left because of climate change, because of overpopulation, because of epidemics and potentially an asteroid strike. These were the things that Stephen Hawkins outlined as the main reasons why he has changed the prediction to only 100 years left. How many of you want to be parents in the future? Okay, most of you. I see most of you are very young. So you still have it ahead of you. When Y2K happened, in year 2000, possibly some of you weren't even born. That was the year when I went through a major thought process what should my future be like? And I was very worried about overpopulation. Seven billion humans on the planet. Now, the human race is the dominant influence on this earth. 500 years ago, before the Industrial Revolution, the impact of the human race was maybe benign. Now, we are shaping the earth. We are mining everything that we can get our hands on. Our idea of economic development is to make everything with concrete, to burn the fossil fuels that it has taken the planet millions of years. Maybe in a million years what they find as our legacy is a layer of plastic that is not biodegradable, which we the human species invented. At that time, in the year 2000, I was thinking about doing a vasectomy. Who knows what that is? Only very few. We call it as well the snap. I'd already googled where are the doctors that can do it. I was seriously considering I will never be a father because we have too many humans on the planet already. I think somehow there was a little voice in the back of my head saying maybe you might change your mind one day. Or maybe I was just too scared to tell my mom what I might intend to do. And now, I am the proud father of a baby daughter. Let me introduce Princess Athena to you. Some of you have seen her already. There she is, my green baby. I didn't follow through with not wanting to put another human on the planet. And I tell you what, I'm happy I didn't follow that through. But I have a huge responsibility now. How can I make sure that she has a future that is bright and clean? If Stephen Hawkins is right and science is moving on, maybe she will become 100, 120, 150 years old. She will experience that time when maybe climate change becomes so impactful on this earth that her future might be at threat and the future of your children and grandchildren. We often talk about let's save the earth, but I think it's all about saving the human species. The planet will survive, but what about the humans? What about the little babies? What about your grandchildren? That is really at stake here. When I came 12 years ago to Malaysia, I had worked with a lot of businesses in Europe on making business go green. When I started coming to Malaysia, my vision was I want to mobilize the masses to live a green lifestyle. I wanted to shift from working with businesses to people, to individuals, to humans. Hello darling, how are you? <laughs> that was my plan. One of the first things I learned when I was driving with a taxi and I asked the taxi driver asked me, hey, what are you doing? I said, I'm a green guy. I want to actually help people to live a green lifestyle. He said, oh, very difficult in Malaysia. Very, very difficult. In Malaysia, 
no money, no talk. Ah, oh, wow, okay. So if it's not about making money, it's not important. We heard that as well earlier today. The affluent people of this world now want to have the super luxury lifestyle. Is really everything all about money? So this is a key question. And then I kind of started to try and understand more and more what shapes people in a developing economy like Malaysia. I realized the history I went through in Germany has not been the same in Malaysia. When I was a youngster, I played in the forest. And those people who grew up in a kampung, in a village, they might have done the same. But that was my playground. In school, we were educated to be a different generation. Nazi Germany made a lot of mistakes, built up a lot of guilt. Our teachers challenged us, be a better generation. Care for humanity, care for peace, care for the planet. At the same time, when I was a youngster, we had acid rain. And the political party, the Green Party, rose in Germany. People were voting green. Suddenly, all politicians became green. And it was the movement of people that made the country more eco-friendly. The businesses at the beginning were saying, cannot go green. It's going to be too expensive. But the German economy became a leader in green technology and actually was able to generate a lot of additional income and business through the green path. When I asked myself the question, have kids in Malaysia been educated that way? Have they gone through that path? I realized no, actually. Maybe their families, maybe the schools were focusing on how to get a big house, how to get a big car. No money, no talk. So really maybe we need to go back a couple of steps and see how we can build it into the education system. A couple of months ago, I gave a talk at a local school and I was extremely impressed with their green eco carnival. A lot of events, a lot of lessons on how we can go green. But actually the problem was the whole activity in how the event was run was not that green. The kids were selling food and huge mountains of waste were building up. We need the holistic education where we actually learn it and do it, learn it and do it, and then it becomes a habit. I spoke with a professor from a local university. His kids grew up in Japan. He told me when he came back to Malaysia, after a couple of months, the little kids, four and five years old, two daughters, were asking him, Daddy, Daddy, where are the recycling bins? They were used to having recycling bins and putting recyclable items when they grew up in Japan in that order, ready to be reused and recycled again. Here, when they came back to Malaysia, they didn't have that infrastructure. They were used to it. They were missing it. We need to really start with the youngsters to create a green generation. Now as a father, I have asked myself the question, how can I make sure that my baby daughter is a positive impact on the planet? How can I show her the path forward? Yes, it's going to be her decision how she is going to live her life, but I have a special role as her father. And let me challenge all of you guys out there. I think we dads, we obviously play a key role in making it all happen, right? Without us being involved, the baby wouldn't be born. So we have a role to play. But very often we might be too busy out there and expect the ladies to take most of the responsibility of education. I think it's time for us to step up. I think it's time for us to take action and it's time for us to be leaders in this area. Now I've come up with four principles that I try to follow to be a green dad. And first of all, I want to say nobody is perfect. I was voted greenest person on the planet, but that still doesn't mean that I do everything in a perfect way. I'm not the vegan yet. I still sometimes eat a little bit of meat. I could improve and go even more green in that aspect of life. Yes, I'm quite radical. I don't have a car. I use public transport wherever possible. But the important thing is nobody is perfect. But it's important we start improving. My first principle is local. 
try and lead by example and get local products. Local food, we buy from the local market. We actually live in the Philippines now. We sourced recently a baby crib made from local bamboo. Bamboo is a beautiful product. It's actually very eco-friendly. It's actually a product that is really good for the local economy. It absorbs very little water. It takes in a lot of carbon dioxide and it is very cheap to produce locally. It's very good for climate change, combating climate change. We got the baby crib for little baby Athena and what happened, neighbors saw it and they approached Mom May Ann and asked her, hey, why do you get the cheap thing for your daughter? Your daughter is so lovely, so precious. You should get the expensive product, the high quality product. That would be the product that would cost five times as much that has been manufactured somewhere in, the, in China in a factory and we get it from a shopping mall. No, we supported the local economy with buying the local product. So we need a major mindset change in this area. Secondly, less is more. Less things can often give you better results. We don't buy what we don't need. The gifts that she has are some of the gifts that are recycled from me, that friends have given us, the toys, and very few we bought ourselves. We recycle clothes, if friends have any clothes. My lifestyle in general is, what I don't need, I don't buy. Most of the time people think green living, and if you have a baby, you need to buy all these expensive green products. Yes, if you want to have eco-friendly nappies, they might be a bit more expensive. We actually partially use eco-nappies and partially use normal nappies. It's difficult to use eco-nappies only, especially if the baby makes a big shock. Sometimes the eco-nappies uh, overflow much easier. Less is more then actually results as well into a different kind of happiness. You are happy not just with things, you are happy with Mother Nature. You are happy with family. You are happy with the dematerialized, zero environmental impact experiences rather than with things. Number three, leverage. What I mean with leverage is work with other organizations. Currently, I'm working with Dwi Imas in Malaysia to inspire the school kids to save electricity at home. And we work with an organization in Singapore, New Era Energy. They have created gamification and tokens to reward the kids for being eco-leaders. This actually provides a lot more incentive for the kids to be part of this than just saving the planet. Another thing I've done recently in the Philippines is the Catholic Church there is very strong. I started to write on the wave of Laudato Si. This was a letter that the Pope wrote to the uh, um, Catholic Church. We all need to preserve the planet. So there's a very strong movement there. When we had the christening of my baby daughter, we made it a zero waste event. We did it on a mountain where we didn't need aircon. We planted 30 trees. We gave every participant a bamboo straw so that we could avoid plastic straw and for them to take home the message you can practice it every day at home. Sometimes when I talk about green I use this tool. It measures the nitrate content in our foods. When people realize how much pollution, how much toxic chemicals we have in our food, they wake up. I have an indoor air quality monitoring system at home in our house. Sometimes the air pollution index goes through the roof because somebody in the local uh, area is doing open burning. If I just go there and tell them stop open burning, I cannot convince them. I go there and show them the API. They see it's dangerous level. It has a face mask. Clean the air, put a face mask on. Final point is leader. Really, if we want to solve the problem of global climate change and avoid the threat of the human species potentially being extinct on this planet, we have to step up as leaders. For me, that means I need to make sure I have more positive impact than negative impact on the planet. For me, that means I have to inspire my daughter that I'm responsible for to follow my footsteps if she so wishes. 
It is my role to make sure that my total environmental impact is eliminated. Actually, my total environmental impact should be positive. I bought a carbon life credit that planted 600 free trees 11 years ago to eliminate all my CO2 emissions. Some of my businesses that I have done absorb carbon dioxide every day. You can do the same. You can even make money with it. The facilities, the opportunities, even the businesses are there already for us to step up as leaders and to make sure that our life has no negative impact on the planet but a positive impact on the planet. What is the future of your child going to be like? What role are you going to play as a dad, as a mother, as a grandmother? I think the only way we can avoid a catastrophe on the planet due to overpopulation and climate change, which is very closely linked with one another, and epidemics that might be actually accelerated by climate change and overpopulation, the only way we can avoid it is if we all step up. At the moment, we are waiting for green technologies and government leaders to solve this problem. We believe that technologies can solve it. Paris Agreement was mainly based on not heating up the earth more than 1.5 to 2 Celsius. And what is the response? Global leaders want technologies to be implemented. Some leaders are already stepping a step backwards, in particularly the USA. I think we need to create a bottom-up movement where all of us stand for something. If we all stand for, I am a healing impact on the planet rather than a burden on the planet, then we can be dads and mothers that our future generation will be proud of. Where do you stand? Will you stand with me? in being a leader of environmental healing for the sake of our future generations.